So if you take a look at Parshas Emor, um, what we have here is a uh, Perk Chaf Gimel in Parshas Emor. Uh, that entire Perk, if you take a look at it, it's a, it's a tour through all of the holidays of the Jewish people. Uh, we go through everything. Uh, we start with Shabbos. We'll have to point that out soon. And then we go from Pesach to Shavuos. Shavuos isn't actually mentioned by name, which is interesting in and of itself, but not a, not a topic we're going to focus on. Uh, despite the fact that it's more Yana Diyama. Then we go to Yom Kippur, we go to Rosh Hashanah, we go to Sukkot, we go to Shemini Atzeres. And uh, we've gone through uh, all of the Yom Tovim. We have some basic guidelines. We don't focus on the Karbonos so much. That's something that the Ramban talks about. The uh, Karbonos are not a focus here, even though some are mentioned. Only the ones that are unique, not as like a Musaf of the day, but let's say, for example, in the Parsha, they're going to talk about certain Karbonos that are brought together with the Shtei Halechem, or the Karbon Omer. There are certain aspects to the day that with them also come certain carbonos. Uh, so we bring a, a barley measure to, uh, to the Beis HaMikdash uh, on the second day of Pesach. So uh, with that comes uh, two animals. And uh, so we're, we're elaborating on those, but we're not elaborating on the Musafim, on the additional offerings that we bring because of the day itself. So it, for the most part, we're really just focusing on the holiday and the unique character of each one. What you do on this one and that one, we talk on sukkah, so that's the fact that you take the Arba Minim, you sit in the sukkah, and on Pesach, uh, we, we talk about all the holidays, basically. Um, so the Ramban, he has a very uh, interesting approach here. I'd say it's more, uh, we haven't seen the side of Ramban too much in our classes, uh, the halakhic uh, textual side, which is uh, what we're going to get into tonight. That's why we don't have his actual commentary. It can, in many ways, if you're just trying to read straight through without a Chumash open in front of you, it can, it can bog you down. You'll have to jump from place to place. So we're going to say everything that he has to say outside. Um, but uh, despite the fact that this is very legalistic, I think it's going to uh, bring us into a certain understanding of how the Moadim work. And it's uh, one that he actually uh, kind of demands of us in the way that he, he formulates everything. So first, uh, it's just worthy of mention, this isn't going to be a focus of this year, but the Ramban, he talks about what, the t- what does the term Mikra'e Kodesh mean? That's going to be a word that comes up a number of times in this parak. Mikra'e Kodesh, the Ramban says, is a, uh, a holy, uh, uh, how do they translate it exactly? Holy convocation, yeah? What does convocation mean? I'm not sure. But what he says is, the Ramban, is that uh, it's a time when everybody gets together. And he suggests that perhaps there is a echi of uh, an obligation, midah raisa, from the Torah. Not just rabbinic, but uh, from Torah law, that Jews have to get together on, on Yom and Tovim, and they have to daven with a minion. Uh, we, do, we don't typically think of that as a chi of, perhaps not a chi of at all. It might depend on your circumstances, how close you are to a minion nearby. But uh, on Yom Tovim, the Ramban says that perhaps we actually have an obligation to, uh, to daven together, to perhaps say halal together. So that's just an interesting uh, idea that he brings out from uh, just simply translating the words. And you'll have a lot of the uh, ideas that we're going to relate to this concept that the Karbanas are, uh, or that the, the Tefillah is a replacement for Karbanas as opposed to being separate? I, if anything, it seems like with the, Ram, the way the Ramban catches uh, this idea is uh, Almost into, it, might, it might be only Mikdash specific, it might only be in the times of the Beis Mikdash that you had this obligation that when people got together at that time on the other regal, that perhaps they had a, an obligation to say halal. He might have intended, it's not so clear, he might have intended uh, that that's an obligation even after the Beis Mikdash is done that you might, might have to find a good Jewish community to, to you know, take the part in the Yom Tovim with. Um, but in any event, the uh, other ideas which we're going to talk about here as you're reading through the parsha, if you actually go through the, uh, you know, if you're, if you're at Kriya Sator, and even if you're paying attention during the, uh, the Kriya on Shabbos, there are things that, that might just, you know, you know, blow by you. Because the, there's just certain terms that we're so used to that we don't even think about what they mean, that uh, the ideas contained within are, are uh, something that the Ramban has to really point out and uh, emphasize. You could be uh, learning, we're going to be talking about the, the Holocaust of Malacha on Yom Tov. Uh, Malacha itself, if you look in the Gemara and Beitza, um, that entire Masechta, that entire tractate is, uh, you deal with cases of, uh, let's say I want to uh, grind spices, I want to I wanna do that, but I need to uh, do it with a certain kind of grinder, etc., or I have to do it with this kind of shinoi or that kind of shinoi, you know, doing things in a strange manner. And the theme of all the, uh, all the issues that you're going to come up with when you go look in the Masechta Spetsa, you're wondering, what are we dealing with here? Are we dealing with an Esr de Araisa, an Esr de Rabbanan? Are we dealing with uh, the, that I have a dispensation that apparently it's okay if I do it with a Shinoi? This doesn't sound like your typical Isser. Right? When we talk about on Shabbos, something being Asr, we don't say, eh, do it with a Shinoi and it's fine. But with certain, uh, certain Malachos on Yom Tov, we seem to have such an idea, and it's, it's very confusing. And uh, if you look at the different Rishonim in the Gemara, they'll actually come up with different approaches as to how to actually uh, tackle all these different cases. But in any event, the Ramban, he gives us a, a mahalik, uh, an approach here, 
to how we can uh, view the halachas of Yom Tov and, and, and Shabbos, and how they're supposed to be different. So uh, let, let's begin with that in mind. So we have to talk about, uh, at the very beginning, we have, at the very beginning of the parak, Dabir Hashem Moshe Lemor, God spoke to Moshe saying, Dabir al-Bnei Yisrael, Omar Ta'alehem, speaks to the Jewish, uh, the Jewish people, say to them, Mo'adai Hashem HaShet Tikru Osam Mekroi Kodesh Elohim Mo'adai. Here are the festivals. These are the ones that, uh, that, that God has ordained that you have to keep. Keep Shabbos. Now, that might seem strange to us. I remember once that uh, when my mother was teaching in a day school that I happened to have been with her and work that day. I was, uh, they had like a quiz between uh, you know, two different teams where they were, they were playing against each other. And like, it was like the final round, like Final Jeopardy kind of thing. You have to list seven holidays seven Jewish holidays, and uh, both groups uh, were involved, and I thought for, for the group that I was involved, I thought, oh, put in Shabbos. And then uh, after we were, uh, you know, tallying up the results to see who could think of uh, as many holidays as they could, when we said Shabbos, the other group was like, what are you talking about? Shabbos isn't a holiday. Shabbos is different. And I think that's our general reaction. We do think of Shabbos as something different. I don't want to give me credit because I'm her son. But uh, in any event, Shabbos is, is not something we typically think of as a holiday. Yet here it is, when we're introducing the holidays as follows. We start off talking about Shabbos. So one could, in fact, suggest it's a holiday. That's what I wanted to do. The Ramban, he suggests that maybe you could say such a thing. And then the point uh, that we're trying to, to make when we just put it in the list, um, and you have to notice that there's also something very strange that happens afterwards. After we talk about Shabbos, in the very next Pasuk, Pasuk Dalet, we say, And now here are the holidays. These are the festivals, the uh, holy convocations that God said you have to keep. And then we start talking about Pesach. It's almost like we were reintroducing the holidays after we said the first one. You don't see that, that kind of uh, introduction by the rest of the holidays that we you know, start uh, checking off the list. So the Ramban suggests it could be, first of all, that Shabbos is in fact a holiday. That could be. That is viewed as a moed. Why this matters, we'll, we'll see later why, what the significance is of whether something's considered a holiday or not. But uh, he suggests that perhaps Shabbos is part of the holidays, but then you have another Pasuk that reintroduces the rest of the holidays, because if you look, Tikru osam b'mo'adam are the last words of the second introduction to the holidays. These are the ones that you should call upon at their appointed season. Right, the Ramban says perhaps what the distinction is, we talk about Shabbos within couching it in the general terms of holidays, and then going on to discuss the rest of them, and only the rest of the holidays, not Shabbos beforehand, are the ones that uh, have to do with appointed seasons. Right, as, as, as we know, Chazal are in some ways con in control of when these holidays fall out. We have specific dates in which they are to occur, but the months themselves, when does a new month start, when does it not, uh, back when we had a Sanhedrin, so Chazal would determine in, in on what day Rosh Chodesh would fall out, and in that way they kind of uh, were able to sometimes even manipulate the calendar in a way that perhaps would seem, you know, not natural with the system of the seasons, uh, of, or when the, when the new moon was seen, etc. If you look in the Gemara and Sanhedrin, they talk about these things. But uh, Chazal were, were in charge in some ways. Asher Tikr Osam Adam, they could make it at appointed seasons. They had some control over when the holidays fell out. Not so by Shabbos. On Shabbos, everything, uh, it's a fixed schedule. Chazal can't do anything no matter when they decide Rosh Chodesh is. It has no bearing on Shabbos because it's every seven days, whether uh, whether the month falls out on one day or another. So perhaps you could say Shabbos is a holiday, but it's distinct in that it doesn't have this Adam kind of flavor to it. And then we go on to say the rest of the holidays. So that's something he suggests. But then he says, at the end of the day, Shabbos is not a holiday. What we're actually talking about here is we're kind of introducing the concept of holidays and then interrupting with, oh, by the way, there's this thing called Shabbos, make sure you keep it, etc. And then we're like, oh, where were we? Oh, we're talking about the holidays. That's how he says you should be uh, reading these psukim. And what are you trying to show? Well, are you about to say something? That Ramban doesn't use the word holiday, so I have less difficulty with uh -huh. your translation convocation than uh -huh. I have with holiday. He says Moadim, Mo which is a word that we'll have to get into its meaning also. Yeah, but it doesn't but, uh, mean holiday, that's uh -huh. sure. So uh, the Moadim, he, he says, is, uh, we're really introducing that from the very beginning of Perakaf Gimel. We kind of have a, um, an interlude, uh, an interruption, when we talk about Shabbos, to communicate something. Yeah. That, uh, Shabbos has a unique character from the, that, that's separate from the other Moadim. It's different in an important way, as I'm sure we'll know we'll get to. And then more than that, that unique character of Shabbos, let's, uh, let's just say, what, what, what is that? What, how is Shabbos different from Yom Tov, in terms of uh, the halakhos, what I have to keep? Good can't cook, right? On Shabbos you can't cook, you can't do the malachas okal nefesh. In, in a simple way of, uh, of uh, speech, we're going to get into more what that means. But a Shabbos is different 
and that I can't do even the malachos that involve uh, food preparation. Whereas on Yom Tov, and it's more complicated than this, but uh, on, on Yom Tov I'm allowed to. So uh, the Ramban is trying to say that Shabbos is different, where we're kind of pointing that out as a caveat before we introduce the rest of the holidays. Shabbos you can't do any malacha. And more than that, if there's ever a situation, happens all the time, where Shabbos and Yom Tov coincide, which one trumps the other? For us it seems so simple, because we just live that way all the time. But what trumps which? Shabbos. Shabbos. Shabbos wins, right? On, uh, on a Shabbos Yom Tov together, uh, you would not be allowed to do malachas on that fish. We wouldn't say, ah, because it's Yom Tov also, I can, I can cook, even on, on the Shabbos. That'd be nice. But, uh, but we can't. Uh, why we can't, though? It's a good question. It's not just that we, we li- like taking the more machmir approach. I don't think that's the, uh, the appropriate response. Um, but there's going to be a reason that I, that I think we'll get to. Okay, so malachas al nefesh, how do we define that concept? things for food. And this is something that the Rishonim, you know, grapple with, so it's not a simple matter that you can just give a, an easy answer to. But I can tell you straight up, there are certain malachos that I could say are, I could rationalize that they are for food, and nevertheless they're forbidden. Probably midah araisa, certainly according to the Ramban. Uh, I'm allowed to shecht an animal. We don't do this anymore because we live in a world of butchers and refrigeration. So we don't have our cows in the backyard that we shechted before Yom Tov and have a good steak. But uh, shechita is actually allowed on Yom Tov. You're allowed to do that, you're allowed to have your steak nice and fresh and uh, slaughter your animal right then and there. Uh, whereas trapping an animal on Yom Tov, that's not permitted. Right? One could argue, what's the difference? It's all local nefesh. I'm allowed to trap this animal. It's, it's for food. Shouldn't that be okay? But that's not allowed. Uh, similarly, um, the malacha of kotzer, of reaping. If I want to take Lisha a pluck of fruit off of a tree. Right? Lisha on, you say. Right, so from Lisha onward, that comes from something. It com- probably comes from the idea that the Ramban's going to tell us. But right, so we don't, we don't assume that Ochal Nefesh is a heter for all malachos involving food. Or that uh, if somehow you could, uh, uh, you know, think of a concept where, let's say, bona, building. I want to build an oven because I need that to heat my food. Right, we wouldn't say that that's okay because it's for Ochal Nefesh. We, we don't do that. Ochal Nefesh is defined by only a very set amount of malachos, and perhaps even those malachos have to be done in a certain way. So, uh, Ochel nefesh doesn't quite satisfy uh, what we uh, what we want to get to. Um, now, how do we define malacha? Well, what's the translation of the term malacha? Uh, how do at least most people say it? I'm sure you know that, that it's an awful translation. What does malacha mean? Work. Work. We say work, but at the same time, uh, we know that, that that's a it's a very imprecise way of of describing the. Uh, uh, what exactly is forbidden? If we have malachet avodah, how do we translate avodah? Ah, very good. Well, obviously, that's a, that's a good point, and in many ways, that's a theme that Ramban's going to you know catch on to. The way we would say work, if anything, in terms of toil, backbreaking labor, we would call that avodah. Maybe we talk about the Jews in Egypt; they were good, um, they underwent avodah kasha, um, and at the same time, we know that malacha it doesn't really it doesn't really, uh, it wouldn't fall under any of the concepts of the 39 malachos, let's say, for me to do something that is, uh, you know, very exerting. If I'm having company and I'm shopping chairs from here and there and I'm, I'm sweating, and uh, it's a uh, very difficult term. Uh, one could, one should, would argue if malacha was defined as work, is uh, let me not do malacha and therefore let me drive to shul on Shabbos instead of walk. That's a, a lot less work. Why do I have to walk for a half hour instead of uh, driving for five minutes? So, but nevertheless, that's not true because the definitions are imprecise. When you have imprecise definitions, that's when people complain and they say, well, why do I have to do this and that on Shabbos? Why can't I just drive, etc., and things like that. When we define the, uh, the terms more uh, accurately, we see that malacha doesn't quite satisfy, uh, work doesn't quite satisfy uh, how malacha uh, should be defined. Uh, we'll, we'll get more into what, what it should be, but in any event, the Ramban, he, he picks on the term malachas avoda. If you look in the, uh, after Shabbos, because Shabbos actually, it says, kol malacha lo sa'asu in Pasuk Gimel. Don't do any manner of malacha. But then if you look in all of the Mo'adim, except Yom Kippur, by the way, which has the same status as Shabbos with regards to malacha, what's actually being forbidden? Take a look at, for example, uh, Pasuk Ches with regards to Pesach. Right? What, are, what are we forbidding? Not malacha, but... Anyway? It's a more specific term. Pasuk Ches? Malacha Savoda, right? That there's this uh, modification of the term malacha, and the Ramban, the way he develops this idea, he says there's two kinds of malacha. There's malacha avoda, which is what you can't do even on Yom Tov. You can't do it on Shabbos either. And then there's malacha hana. That's not a term that you'll find in Chumash anywhere, but it's a malacha for for personal benefit. 
um, on Shabbos, we ask her, Kol Malacha Losasu, don't do any kind of Malacha, neither of the two types. Whereas on Yom Tov, you can only do, the only thing that's forbidden to you is Malachas Avoda, work that is, uh, I think it's translated typically has, uh, let's see, what do they do here? Servile work? Yeah, servile work. It's uh, things that are, that are very much uh, a tirka. So the things that are very much um, things that are, are weighing upon you. Now take a look. Uh, well we've seen this concept before a little bit. If you, uh, the, the, the concept of ochal nefesh. If, if I didn't read this Ramban, if I didn't see the fact that he made a distinction between malacha and malacha savoda, I would still know about the concept of ochal nefesh from Chumash itself. If you look in uh, Perk Yud Beis in Shemos, Pasuk um, Tezayin, so 12.16. In Exodus. So here's where the, the term first comes up with regards to uh, the observance of Pesach. It's the first holiday we have. So it's on page, if you have the Sensino, page 390. So what he says is, Uvayom Harishon, and on the first day, the first day of Pesach, so Mikra Kodesh, that is a, again a holy convocation. Vayom Hashvi Mikra Kodesh, same thing on the seventh day, the seventh day of Pesach also is a Yom Tov. Yelachem, it'll be for you. Kol Malacha Lo Yaase. Notice how we don't have the modification of Malachas Avoda, right? Don't do any kind of Malacha, but him on these days. However, even though I just said don't do any Malacha, there are some Malachas you could do. Anything that's for the purposes of food. That's something that you can do. So that's where they, we originally get the concept of ochal nefesh. And most assume that from there we say, oh, and just like in that plastic it says you can have ochal nefesh on Pesach, we have in all the other holidays. Rabban says that's not true. Uh, we don't learn it in that way. Although there are certain things that we learn from one holiday to the other, just uh, by, based on the fact that they're grouped together, for example, in our parsha. Um, this idea actually comes from the fact that later on, after we've gotten the concept of, of Malacha Savoda, you know, clarified in Shemos, it's kol malacha minus ochal nefesh. So now that term is called, I mean, what, what's left is called malacha savoda. And every time in Parshas Emor, when we go through every single holiday, we say kol malacha savoda, lo sa'asu, any type of servile work you shouldn't do, what we're saying is all non ochal nefesh malachas are things that you could do. Um, so uh, what we have is Pesach providing somewhat of a framework in Shemos as to how to understand what, what the term Malachas Avoda means. And then we use that term for the rest of Chumash, and that's how uh, we understand what exactly uh, the differences are between the days. Now, there's another difference between the Malachas of Shabbos and Yom Tov. It's with regards to punishment. Uh, can anybody, does anybody know the, uh, well, what happens if a person uh, does a Malachas on Shabbos? Let's say there's witnesses, and they say, uh, you know, don't do it. They give a proper warning, and they do everything exactly as uh, witnesses are supposed to do. We have Mm -hmm. Right, because you say it's him, so what happened to him? He might have been actually a specialty case because, by definition, we didn't know what to do. How could they have possibly given him a warning? So some uh, some commentaries actually say that that was actually with regards to killing him. It was a uh, horach, uh, it was a temporary uh, ruling. But uh, af after him, we made a rule that uh, anytime somebody does something on Chavez, uh, you need to give them proper warning with two witnesses, then they have to be taken to court and everybody has to be cross-examined. There's a whole process by which it's very rare that actually somebody would get the death penalty by the hands of, of man by an earthly court. But ultimately, in potential, there exists in doing malacha on Shabbos, a chi of skila, an obligation for stoning. It's uh, not, not just uh, simply everybody pelting with rocks. All the, all the misos are not what they sound like, by the way. Uh, skila is, in fact, first they push the guy off a cliff, then they push gigantic rock on him, and then if he's still not there, they throw little rocks on him. It's a very interesting process. And chenek, uh, strangulation, is not uh, not simply that you hang a guy like we typically see in like Wild West films. Actually, uh, one person takes a cloth on one end and wraps it around his neck. The other person takes a cloth on the other end and they both play tongue war. <laughs> There's a, a lot of interesting uh, things about about a Misa. What's important to know, most of all, is that it's very rare. Uh, the the uh, qualifications that are needed to actually make that happen uh, are you know, make it to the point where it's almost non-existent. They'll have somebody actually. Chayv Misa from, uh, from a base bin. But nevertheless, it exists in potential. And let's say a person does a malacha on purpose on Shabbos. And again, we have to, on purpose means something very specific. But let's say they do it on purpose and no, no witnesses are around to warn him. What's his penalty? Karis. It's uh, viewed as a very severe spiritual punishment that he's... What exactly that term means, by the way, 
that, that was something we didn't get to last week. I told you last week's run button was, was chock full of goodies. And, uh, and last week uh, there was a discussion about what Karis is. But uh, for the most part, it means that that person's soul is cut off from any connection to Hashem in the next world. Obviously, there's truva and, and you know ways to ways to you know you know uh, reverse that process. But it's 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 the most severe uh, penalty bidei shemayim that that, the, that heaven can administer upon us. Whereas by Yom Tov, what's the penalty if I do malacha? Is it the same thing? Hmm? Malachas. Malachas, right. It's not the same thing. That it's a, really, a, we would call it just a, a, a losa, say, a lav. It's a negative commandment. You shouldn't do malacha on Yom Tov. If you do, you get malachas. This is also, again, only when you have witnesses and warning and, and that whole process, then the person can get lashes. We don't kill such a person. And if they do it uh, on purpose without witnesses, so then there's no, uh, there's no malachas, there's no lashes. That person uh, he has to do tshuva. But, uh, at the, uh, you know, there's no kares in such a situation. So it's less severe. Uh, we're, we're talking very halakhic uh, uh, ideas right now. We're, we're going we're to get to uh, more uh, hashkafic ideas soon. But uh, in any event, we, we have differences that are crucial. We have uh, malachas avoda is what's asra on Yom Tov. Kol malacha is what's asra on Shabbos. Shabbos, the punishment, is much more severe than it is on Yom Tov. So we kind of start to develop an idea that I think is against the way we typically imagine these things. We typically uh, think of uh, Shabbos and Yom Tov on both of them, I can't build a house. So therefore, it's, it's really, it's, uh, the idea, the nature of the days must be the same. Right? And, uh, you know, okay, I have an exception. I view Ochel Nefesh on Yom Tov as an exception. Like, I have this general framework of Shabbos borrowed from Yom Tov. Uh, Yom Tov borrows it. And there are certain things that we take out. But essentially, in their character, the days have the exact same function. But uh, if you take a look at the way that Ramban tells us to read these psukim, he says you have uh, Malachas Avoda is the only thing which we're being told to avoid with regards to the Yom Tovim. And the, the, again, this aspect of the fact that the punishments are different, you know, it, it, begs, uh, it begs us to start suggesting that maybe the function of each day is actually very different. Even though they seem the same in the fact that there are certain activities which are forbidden in one and forbidden in the other, the way that they're forbidden, and uh, you know the nature of how the you know that Isser actually originates, will actually lead us to believe that there's uh, different ways we should be looking at these days. Um, one more thing I wanted to note: if you take a look in Perk Chaf Gimel, Pasuk Chaf Dalad, back in Bayikra, in our parsha, so we're talking about Rosh Hashanah here. Um, so it says here, Daber El Bnei Yisrael Lemor. It's on page 753 in the uh, Sanzino. Daber El Bnei Yisrael Lemor. Speak to the children of Israel, saying, on the seventh month, again, seven, starting from Nisan, not from, a, we usually t- think of Rosh Hashanah as the beginning of the year. From uh, the Jewish holiday perspective, it's actually in the seventh month of the year. So in the seventh month, on the first day of the, of the month, it should be for you, a uh, Shabbaton. It should be a, uh, uh, you should have a day in which you have a remembrance of, of the uh, shofar. We use that term. Also to talk about when we don't blow shofar, perhaps on Shabbos, and uh, also again a holy convocation. But what exactly does the term Shabbason mean? The, the term it comes up in a number of other places. I looked in, in Chumash. This is the only time where it comes. Uh, kind of has a command. For you it shall be uh, Shabbason. I don't know if this is this pasuk is where the term Shabbaton comes from, but the Ramban in describing exactly what this uh, what this command is. What are you what are you telling me to do? When you say um, he describes it as a, a certain kind of mandate. It's a, a positive commandment. Again, this is what, what, what makes this interesting is he thinks this is mida araisa. This is a, a biblical command. This is not just. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about it when we see out the idea. It, it's to keep the holiday free of uh, any kind of tircha, of excessive uh, effort, things that make you sweat, things that make you uh, very uh, tired, and uh, you shouldn't have any commerce on it either. And he says, if you didn't have this demand. You could have all of the uh, all of the things that we're obligated to keep on Yom Tov, not doing malacha, except for the ones that uh, are are for ochal uh, nefesh for food, and still people could make the day entirely hefker. You could have uh, you could have people uh, you know in the marketplace selling their wares. You could have uh, people loading donkeys and going back and forth and hiring workers and doing all these things on Yom Tov, and there would be no penalty. It wouldn't go against a single thing that the Torah is commanding me to do when I keep these days. And nevertheless, we don't want that to happen, Ramban says. So while most would understand, uh, you know, the prohibition against commerce, etc., on, on Yom Tov has something which is rabbinical in nature, uh, the Ramban says it's a, this demand for Shabbaton actually is the Araisa. 
It's a, it's a biblical obligation. So if we're going to try to figure out the nature of the day in terms of how God sees it, right? So sometimes when you want to find out Ta'anei HaMitzvahs, you want to understand the nature of a given mitzvah, of a commandment, we, uh, we you kind of have to leave the Rabbanans on the side for a little bit. Because the Rabbanans, those are very often meant to safeguard the principles that the Torah is commanding us, but they don't actually, they're kind of uh, placed on top. They're scaffolding. They're not really part of the structure itself. And if you're trying to develop a theory, you want to ignore them. So it's very significant here that the Ramban thinks that, uh, you know, forbidding us from uh, engaging in commerce and excessive work, that kind of thing, that's inherent to the day. That's something that the Torah demands of us. And uh, something we didn't see from last week, the Ramban and Parshas Kedoshim. So we talked about that first, uh, the first statement the Ramban had, had as to what Kedoshim to you means, what it means to be holy. He said it means to... Uh, try to go beyond the letter of the law with regards to, uh, in that example, he talked about uh, matters of taiva, of uh, physical urges. Right? A person uh, shouldn't uh, overindulge in even permitted uh, you know, sexual relationships or permitted foods. A person uh, should have this attitude of, uh, I'm not in this world just to get uh, you know, pleasure. A person should have a certain attitude of, I'm here to serve Hashem. Uh, these are things which I'm allowed to enjoy to a certain extent, and I have to you know, sublimate them. I have to use them in service of a Kaddish Baruch Hu. But the Ramban, he says further there, I'll quote you what he says. He says, This is actually the way of the Torah. You'll see examples like this uh, throughout. After the Torah will give you a lot of details in terms of uh, what the halacha is. Don't do this, don't do that, etc. Says, don't steal, don't rob, all those other warnings. Then it will say in a more general sense afterwards, the Torah itself. No, not the rabbis, not a samachomer here. Basisa hayasher v'hatov, and you should do the straight and good. You should, you should be a good guy. Sheyachnis ba'aseh hayosher v'hashvaya v'chol if nimishur asadin l'ritzon chaviraf. But now there's a Torah obligation to say, listen, these are the things that are absolutes. You don't mess with these. Don't steal. Don't rob. But by the way, as a general principle, general outlook, you're supposed to have. You're supposed to have, so to speak, a kedoshim to you of monetary law. Right? You, have to, you have to do what's right and, and uh, you know, do the right thing, which isn't always necessarily just what the strict letter of the law demands of a person. Right? Sometimes people will go after each other and abase them, and they'll say, uh, I'm right, you owe me money, and I'll say, oh, you're right. Uh, but, uh, and it might be that there's a legal decision to be made, who is the rightful owner of the money, but at the same time, there should be an attitude between, you know, both litigants should have, of, I'm not just out to, for my own personal gain, that's not why I'm coming to abase them. I'm coming to uh, reach the right conclusions, and uh, if it requires, uh, if it's better for me to uh, perhaps uh, be mochel on whatever it is that's owed to me, for whatever reason, this person needs the money perhaps more than I do, what to do v'hayosher v'hatov, to do what's good and straight, that's, uh, that would be demanded of me perhaps in certain situations to, uh, you know, to be mochel. It's important we have to have this realization of what's demanded by the letter of the law, and then at the same time, the spirit of the law is something which is in some ways binding upon us. We have to, perhaps, we, we perhaps have more leeway as to when to apply it, when not to. But we have this in general, uh, you know, this directive that we're supposed to keep with the spirit of the law. And then he says, Okay, I said that already. I'm going to talk about this later. Same thing with regards to Shabbos. We have the Malachos, the Malachos, the things which are forbidden, but then at the same time, uh, excessive exertion and uh, really, uh, you know, grinding ourselves down. Even if I'm not doing a malacha, that's also forbidden on the level of a mitzvah ase, a positive commandment. Shanem, it says, Tishbos, it says in two different instances in Shemos when it talks about Shabbos, you shall rest, and active you shall rest, not just refrain from malacha, actively rest. And I'll explain this more, and that's the Ramban to this week's parsha, where he talks about the idea that uh, with regards to Shabbos and with regards to Yom Tov, Shabbason, what that is is it's a demand that uh, even when you you've satisfied the, uh, the low sases, the negative commandments of not doing a malacha, and uh, etc. on Yom Tov. Uh, at the same time, Shabbaton, you have to actively make sure that there's a certain quality and character of this day, and if you don't do it, you're, you're, you're being over, you're violating an iser ase, a positive commandment. It's a, it's a biblical commandment. It's not just, uh, oh, it's not Shabbos dick, it's not Yom Tov dick. Very often when we, when we resort to that in describing uh, what's forbidden, what's not on Shabbos, right, uh, certain kinds of behavior, People very often like shrug it aside. They say, "What do you mean that's not Shabbos? Like that's if you can't pin it down on a certain malacha, if you can't tell me why it's us there, the, then it should be fine." What the Ramban is saying is not only from a rabbinical perspective, from the Torah's own perspective, Tishbos, you should keep Shabbos actively, and and Yom Tov it says Shabboson. You should uh, you should make this a day uh, specifically of uh, having a certain spirit and nature to it. 
That's uh, something that a demand that the Torah is giving us. This, this relates to Ramosha's discomfort with the Grimma switch. Ah, right. And we talk about uh, Grimma switches and timers and all these yeah. things. Yeah, or perhaps even a certain uh, level of, of dress on Shabbos or people, I think, uh, you know, it, this is more complicated, but, uh, you know, for example, uses of electricity on Shabbos. There are many different opinions among the, uh, you know, Akronim, the, the later authorities, as to what, what is there exactly, what malacha am I doing when I, uh, when I, when I use electricity. Um, Rav Shlomo Zaman Arbach said he, a lot of these uh, rationales are very hard to justify. They, they, don't, they don't seem to work. They don't seem to plug in well. No pun intended. But uh, at the same time, uh, he said, at, at the end of the day, we're, we're knowing Boeser. We assume that this is forbidden. And uh, it's not just a, oh, it's not Shabbos thing. It's a, the, there, there is an active key by which a, there's a certain character and quality of the day that I need to keep, uh, you know, with Shabbos. It might be that my phone, using electricity, now I'm not closing any circuits and you get into the complications of what exactly, how electricity works. These are uh, not incandescent bulbs that my, that my screen is going on. It might not be mavi or it might not be lighting a fire. But if I used this on Shabbos, I would destroy the quality of the day. It would be the one day uh, of the week where, where I wouldn't be driven crazy by this thing. And uh, it, w- it, would, it would ruin the day. It would. And then the Ramban is saying that that's something that the Torah itself is demanding of us that we have to keep. Um, yeah, so just uh, with that, th- those are our unique ideas that the Ramban brings to this week's parsha. It's very legalistic. Uh, well, but at the same time, the fact that the Ramban says we have a mandate to keep the spirit of the day, so now we have to define what exactly is the spirit of the day. Does that mean the Rambam doesn't count Yelachim Shabbaton as one of his mitzvot? I don't think it's. I don't think it's viewed actively as a mitzvah. A mitzvah to say by the by the Rambam. Rambam but the Rambam does. Rambam, I think. Or you, you'd have to look. The Rambam has his own uh, commentary. Is uh, his issues that he takes with the Rambam say for mitzvahs. I'd be curious to see if he invokes this as a as a positive commandment in its own right. Yeah, but I'm really looking into it, how is it yelach and shavatan? If you understand the grammar, he says it will be for you. It shall be. But I think it shall, it shall, shall be, be. Will be. Whatever it is. But it's just simply. If you do all these things, you'll feel like it's Shabbaton, as opposed to, I'm, I'm taking the second of the Advarim, uh, uh-huh. which means that the language Yelacha can be understood as, as a, command. a command. I think it there is. The negative, it's Lo Yelacha, therefore here it's Yelacha. Mm-hmm. It's the positive of Sorry. that same language. So one Most of the other times I looked and I was like, why does the Ramban talk about the Shabbaton? That term comes up many times before in Chumash also. I noticed that the reason why he might have said it here is because if you look, every other usage of that term in Chumas, it's Shabbason Hu. It's, a, it's more descriptive. It's, it's a day of Shabbos, a Shabbaton, whatever it is. And it doesn't, it's not viewed as a demand. Here, I think you have to say it is, and that's why he has to tackle it. He has to say what is demanding of us. He says this applies to Shabbos, uh, Yom Tov as a whole. This uh, demand of Shabbaton by Rosh Hashanah. Again, like we mentioned, there are a lot of these Moadim, a lot of the Yom Tovim can be grouped together. Uh, in terms of the halachos from one can be generalized to the rest because of the fact that they're all viewed as Elohim Adai. All of these in this parsha are grouped in, in one certain way that they can be learned out from each other. And with regards to Shabbos, which we said has a different character, uh, the Chumash tells us Tishbos, you shall make it a day of rest. That's so to speak the, the Shabbason, the keeping the quality of the day, that commandment for Shabbos as well. So with that in mind, in terms of the halacha, I think, I think we could start going into uh, not, not so to speak Tameha Mitzvahs, is, but I guess it is, but uh, more of a, an approach to what these days are about. Like we said, uh, the quality of Shabbos and the quality of Yom Tov, based on the fact that the, what I'm told not to do is very different. Not just that uh, I have an exception of Ochel Nefesh on Yom Tov. Like the Ramban said, you're being told on Yom Tov to have a totally different perspective. You, you can't do uh, Malachas Avoda, right, as opposed to Kol Malacha. And uh, on Shabbos, uh, the punishment is... Uh, is skila. It's, it's a stoning being stoned by death on, on Yom Tov. It's not anywhere near as severe. So we have to start talking about uh, what is the goal of Shabbos? What is the goal of Yom Tov? How are these different? And I think if you look in Rishim Shonar Fala uh, Hirsch's work, uh, Chorif, this is a, just a fantastic book where he gives you like a Tameha Mitzvah's approach of all the laws that we keep practically nowadays. And he does it from, from a certain perspective that I think we always need to keep in mind when we talk about Tameha Mitzvah's. When we talk about reasons for the commandments, we can't use them to inform how we should practice. Right? We kind of work from the halacha out. We have certain laws that we take for, you know, that we learn in a certain way from the Gemara, from Poskim, um, and we don't theorize until we perhaps have a, a general picture of what the law tells us to do. And then after that, you can build from, from the law that you know what I can do, what I can't do, you can start to develop a philosophy. But if you do it the other way around, it could be very destructive. If I have a philosophy of what the, how the law should work, 
and then I use that to say, oh well, and this should be mutter, that should be usher, etc. Uh, it'll corrupt the Torah because who says your theory is correct? Your theory has to be based on something, and uh, Rafersha uh, bases it on the law. He talks uh, very clearly how everything plugs very nicely into, uh, you know, uh, what, what the law demands of us. So, with regards to Shabbos, Rafersha uh, has uh, just a beautiful approach to Shabbos. Even even his uh, opponents of his time in Germany, people that were not so much into his uh, his uh, approach of Torah and Derek Eretz, of being involved in the world and uh, you know having a perhaps a, uh, an appreciation for what, for what the outside non-Jewish culture has to offer. So uh, even, even they, his, his, his opponents, they, they were very much, I think they said his, his exposition on Shabbos is one of the most beautiful uh, explanations imaginable. And uh, with that, we can go into what he says. So he says what Shabbos represents is that man, as a part of creation, uh, we're, we're ultimately in charge of the world. Uh, we're the only beings in the world that have Bechira. We have free choice. We can decide what to do, what not to do. And uh, being the only, uh, you know, creatures with Bechira, and we're also pretty darn smart, but we're the ones that basically decide what direction the world goes in. You know, we talk about it like the circle of life and every single thing doing its function, it does it without thinking about it. It does it, you know, the grass grows without deciding to grow. Animals do what they do without any, you know, moral decisions in that, in that regard. Man is unique in that he can kind of, on his own, determine what he wants to do, and with that he can decide the course of the whole world, whether it's going, well, going to... Uh, do Ratzon Hashem or not do Ratzon Hashem? Who says we're going to choose well? No one. Uh, that's the whole point of Bechir. Uh, it's, uh, it's up to us. Um, but uh, Hashem, He saw that we needed to, we needed something, uh, you know, in place to keep us focused, uh, to keep us, uh, you know, thinking about our mission. And He says uh, Shabbos does that. And how does it do so? So uh, I'll quote you. Uh, just read to you what Rav says in Chorei. This is. Uh, Hope you don't mind that I'm not reading the original German. I'm going to go with the English here. So he says, Behold, God crowned his work with the seventh day of creation, the first of human activity, and bestowed on it a constantly recurring sanctity and a blessing. A sanctity that through it, uh, man should be con continually reminded of his appointment by God in God's world to be God's servant, and that he should devote himself to that capacity. In other words, man has to understand that through his Bechira, through his free choice, he is going to determine the direction of the world. It's going to go hopefully in, in, in doing the Ratzon Hashem. A blessing that on the seventh day, spirit and mind should always gain renewed strength for the worthy fulfillment of his duty. The Sabbath, the first day on which God withdrew from active creation to invisible guidance of the universe. That's where Hirsch, by the way, he says, Vayinafash. What does that mean, that God, God rested? Uh, hopefully you don't translate it that way because it doesn't make sense theologically. God doesn't need a rest. He doesn't get exhausted. Vayinafash, Rav Hirsch understands, says, uh, God uh, made him himself a soul in the world, so to speak. Just like I have a soul, I know I do. And at the same time, I can't, I can't see it, I can't prove it to you that I have such a thing, but, but it's something I feel. Uh, in the same way God made himself a soul of the world, he's not manifest, you know, clear in front of us, but he's nevertheless, he, he's in the world in a way that we can't uh, directly perceive, but that we could feel if, we were, if we're really in touch. So he says, so God made himself invisible, and the earth was laid open for man's government. So thus, became, the Shabbos became the symbol of man's appointment by God, symbol of God's rule and man's destiny. But how can Shabbos become such a symbol, education and sanctification for this task? So six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seven days of Shabbos unto the Lord thy God. How? In it thou shalt not do any manner of work. How above all does man show his domination over the earth, and that he can fashion all things in his environment to his own purpose? The earth for his habitation and source of sustenance, plant and animal for food and clothing. He can transform everything into an instrument of human service. He is allowed to rule over the world for six days with God's will. Malacha has referred to translated, and I think this is how you have to translate it. It's not, uh, it's not tircha, it's not, uh, you know, effort and schwitzing. It's, uh, it's, it's creative activity. That's what makes man unique. Besides the fact that we have uh, Bechira, that we have, uh, we have a free choice, we also have certain capabilities that go beyond what any other creature in the world has. We have a certain ability to create that nothing else does. So he is allowed, man is allowed to rule over the world for six days with God's will. On the seventh day, however, he is forbidden by divine behest to fashion anything for his own purpose. In this way, what, what do you accomplish by not doing malacha? He acknowledges that he has no rights of ownership or authority over the world. Nothing may be dealt with as man pleases, for everything belongs to God, the Creator, who has sent man into the world to rule it according to his word. On each Shabbos day, the world, so to speak, is restored to God, and thus man proclaims both to himself and to his surroundings that he enjoys only a borrowed authority. That uh, when a person refrains from doing malacha, when a, when a person stops, he's essentially giving back that control to Hashem for that one day. And why is he doing that? He's doing that to not let himself go overboard, to, to not let him uh, become carried away with his creative abilities and his unique standing in the world, where he can, 
easily, uh, you know, digress into, uh, you know, using that for his own purposes in a way that doesn't uh, guide the world in the way that God wants it to be. And what Shabbos does is uh, a person, he gives up on, on, on what makes him most human for a day to make him refocus on what it's supposed to be about. Uh, well, why am I doing this? And uh, I'm supposed to be doing this for HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And then the uh, refresh continues. Therefore, even the smallest work done on Shabbos is a denial of the fact that Hashem is creator and master of the world. It is an arrogant setting up of man as his own master. It is a denial of the whole task of the Jew as man and as Israelite, which is nothing but the management of the earth according to the will of God. It therefore, and this is important based on what we've talked about, it therefore incurs death and excision from the congregation of Israel. It has a very severe punishment. On the other hand, every refraining from work on Shabbos is itself a positive expression of the fact that God is the creator and master of the world, that it is he who has set man in his place, that he is the lawgiver of his life. It is a proclamation and acknowledgement of our task as men and Israelites. And what Refresh is saying, I think, is very much what the Ramban says. Shabbos is unique in its character, how? Not just because it has a very uh, severe punishment. It has a very severe punishment because what is inherent to the day? How do I, how do I express the idea that Shabbos, what Shabbos is all about, of giving up my, uh, myself to Hashem and rededicating myself? It's through refraining from work. The very purpose of Shabbos, and we'll see wh why this is a big deal when we contrast it to Yom Tov. On Shabbos, the main purpose of what I'm doing uh, is, is to stop working. But to not do malacha, to not do creative action, that's what Shabbos is all about. And then... He can do so. He talks about malacha. Malacha is, is a creative action, uh, but the way I achieve Shabbos's goals is through refraining from that. That's uh, giving ourselves up. But the refresh then says he has another section about uh, the Isser malacha on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. We have to get into that. That might be uh, at some time later, but uh, that, that's a little bit different than the rest of the Malandim. There's a separate chapter dedicated to that. But now he has another section where he talks about the malachos uh, on the Isser malacha. Malachas Avoda, more specifically, on the Moadim, on Shavuos, on Sukkot, and Shemini Atzeres. So here things are different. Uh, what does the word Moed mean? We didn't get into this. We, we mentioned it briefly earlier. If I say Ohel Moed, how does everybody translate Ohel Moed? The place where Moshe went to, to meet with God and talk to him. Tent of meeting. Tent of meeting. That's how the Chumash typically translated, and it's accurate. What do you do when you have a meeting? And we all get, if we were all getting together to have a meeting, is that the same thing as us together and like saying, hey, let's go get a cup of coffee? <laughs> They're very different in terms of their function. A meeting means, and this is how we use it in our day-to-day our -day usage, kind of like people in a company, they get together, they have a very specific agenda and topic they need to talk about, they have a meeting. They come to the, so similarly, Moshe goes to the Ohel Moed, he has to talk to Hashem about something specific. He has to have a certain communication from God about a, a specific message, a specific question he has to ask God. So in the same way that we use the word Moed to mean meeting there, where Hirsch points out, that's what it means with regards to the holidays also. Moadim, our, our meeting times. He says as follows. He says, Moadim, appointed seasons. They summon us to submit ourselves entirely to the contemplation and inner realization of those ideas which lie at their foundation. Just as Moed in the spatial sense refers to the locality which men have as their appointed place of assembly for an appointed purpose, so Moed in time is a point of time which summons us con communally to an appointed activity. In this case, an inner activity. Thus, Moadim are the days which stand out from the other days of the year. They summon us from our everyday life to halt and to dedicate all our spiritual activities to them. The Moadim interrupt the ordinary activities of our life and give us spirit, power, and consecration for the future by... I'm not sure if this is English, but revivifying those ideas upon which our whole life is based, or they eradicate such evil consequences of past activity as are deadly to body and spirit, and thus restore to us lost purity and the hope of blessing. Well, what he's about to say is the, 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 the ideas will vary depending on the nature of the holiday. Each holiday has its own message for the Jewish people, but there's, there's something that each holiday has to tell us that's distinct. It's going to be separate from Shabbos, it's gonna, and each one's going to actually be separate from each other as well. But uh, like we said, the, the nature of Malacha um, it, it changes on Yom Tov. It's not as severe of a punishment. Uh, there's a very different type of thing that's forbidden to me, Malachas Avoda. So why is that? So he's going to say, I think we could say it outside at this point, the goal is not achieved like by Shabbos. I don't achieve the goal of the day of the holiday by, by not doing Malacha. On Shabbos that was the case because I'm simply rededicating myself to God. I'm giving up being a human being in the optimal sense for a day a week to rededicate myself. That itself is, is the actual function of the day. If I, if I do malacha, I'm denying the purpose of the day in a very severe way. I'm, I'm deserving skila, stoning. Whereas if it's on Yom Tov, the Isra malacha is not a function in and of itself. It's a function of tapping into the messages of the day. Malacha is not viewed as, when I seize from it, it's not to stop it on its own, in its own merit, but it's to avoid distractions. It's actually meant to keep me from doing the things that are going to uh, prevent me from absorbing the messages of the day. 
we talked earlier about Shabbos, and like the Ramban said, there's supposed to be a certain spirit of the day that you have to tap into. It's probably referring to what Rav Hirsch said, that there's a, a certain mentality I need to lock into. My not doing malacha is going to help me in tapping into that message. But it's not the be-all and end-all when I don't do malacha. And that way it's viewed less severely, and they're actually heterim, not just a heter, but in fact a, a chiyuv. I'm supposed to cook on Yom Tov. I'm supposed to have the freshest, nicest food, things that make me happy, things that make me able to tap into the, uh, you know, into the unique messages of the day. And uh, because of that, I, I'm allowed and actually demanded to do, you know, malaka socha mefesh. I'm supposed to cook. I'm supposed to try to have the, the finest uh, things imaginable. But only when, and this is how this actually reflects in reality in terms of nowadays when we have refrigeration, it probably doesn't change things, but it's something that we should think about. Uh, the heter that we have a lot in many cases, let's say shechita, shechting, slaughtering an animal on Yom Tov. Why can't I just do that before and put it in the fridge, etc.? Apparently, the food is best when it's really absolutely fresh. When, it, when, bake, when bread is freshly baked, cooked that day, it, it tastes better. You know, refrigeration technology, uh, keeping things from rotting perhaps faster. At the same time, it's, it's not the same. There's leftovers, it's not, it's not as good as the, as the freshest thing in the world. But let's say you're dealing with a food that actually doesn't improve by being fresh, and you have examples of this that the Gemara discusses. You can't do that on Yom Tov. You have to do that before. The only time you had a heter to do something was when it actually provided more joy to the day. Your heter for Ochel Nefesh is only when it's purely going to you know, involve more positive, uh, you know, you know, hana, enjoyment to the day than it would if I didn't do it earlier. Because otherwise, <coughs> it's a distraction which is unwarranted. It, it, it detracts from being able to get into the messages of the day. And uh, the first you goes on. The mm -hmm. of a boiled egg as part of the Eru, because indeed a boiled egg is a boiled egg, and one shouldn't make that for one. Yeah, should one. A we boiled egg. That a boiled egg would be made beforehand, and that would be your Eru. We, we typically do. We, we typically assume it, it is more complicated, admittedly, that we, we talk about certain... Uh, we kind of assume in terms of halakha that every food is better fresh. There are exceptions like the Torah says, uh, or so like the Gemara says, but... Uh, oh, you could just say it's, it's hot, it's better hot. A anytime you can invoke even the slightest improvement, it, it becomes allowed. But uh, but just the fact that you have that detail in the law, and like we said with Hirsch, he likes to build up on the, on the halakhos itself, bring, developing a theory from that. The reason why I have a heter, the, the, only, thing, the only reason why malakhas avoda is the only thing that's asr on Yom Tov, is because the other malacha, like we, talk, like we talked about in Ramban, malacha is hana, malacha that actually helps me in enjoying and, and tapping into the messages of the day, so that's something we encourage. And, uh, but because of that also, when I do malacha, am I denying the essence of the day? In some ways, I'm, I'm certainly committing an error, but not nearly as much as on Shabbos. On Shabbos, the purpose is actually communicating something by not doing malacha. On Yom Tov, I don't do malacha because it distracts me. It's a very different nature of the Yisra, that's why it's treated differently in terms of halakha, what's mutter, what's asr, and when I do in fact violate such an avera on Yom Tov, the, the punishment is much less severe, because it isn't as inherent to the day. Those are ideas which I think you develop, and uh, Rav Hirsch, uh, he, he wrote extensively his notes that uh, his Talmidim look into, and they you know, try to develop, uh, you know, where did he, because Rav Hirsch and Chorif, he doesn't talk about uh, his sources, typically, um, but uh, people look at his notes, and I can imagine this section, of what's the difference between Shabbos and Yom Tov, and, and the very character that they have, and, and the Isra Malacha within them, I think it definitely stems out of this Ramban that we saw this week, as to how he looks at uh, Yom Tov being a Malacha Savoda, and Shabbos being Malacha, and that there's this quality of Shabbos, or, or Tishbos, that a person has to actively infuse the day with a certain spirit, that that spirit is actually, uh, this would be one of those unique situations where perhaps Tameh HaMitzvos does play in, to how I observe the day. Right, if we talk about the, the mandate of Tishbos and Shabbosan, which is essentially telling us, don't do things that are not Shabbosdik, don't do things that are Yom Tovdik. So how do I determine what Shabbosdik was Yom Tovdik? That, that comes from looking at the laws, developing a theory, and then with that theory being able to associate it to things that, I would, that aren't technically Yasser, but probably go against what I would call the spirit of the law. And uh, that Ramban in uh, last week's Parsha, Parsha Kedoshim, I think would uh, tell us that uh, what Refersh is saying is in many ways commanded upon us, not just in the strict sense of malachos, but in terms of how I need to keep the quality of the day. I have to be, have a certain dedication to the message of Yom Tov, Shavuos is coming up. I have to be thinking, I have to really be dedicated to thinking about Matan Torah. I have to think about what the uh, Shtei Halechem represent, and I shouldn't be distracted too much by, by anything for that matter, even if it doesn't involve a malacha. I have to have a certain focus, which is what the laws are meant to engender. And uh, with that, we'll, uh, we'll end.